Welcome to a video review for exam 2 in General Chemistry 1. I'm just going to jump right in here and get going because this will probably be a bit of a long video. So chapter 4 is the first chapter uh, in Unit 2 of Gen Chem 1. That's enough numbers for you. So here at the beginning here we're talking about chemical equations, subscripts versus coefficients. Obviously I do expect you to know the difference between those two. That is a very basic chemistry point there. But really the point of this uh, discussion here at the beginning is balancing. Uh, knowing how to balance chemical equations. I absolutely expect you to be able to balance chemical equations for this exam. So the uh, exam will have probably uh, three or so equations that I will expect you to balance. Uh, that's a good normal uh, for my uh, exam twos. Uh, by the way, I'm trying to record this video in a very general sense that it can be used uh, in multiple semesters, so I'm going to try and not give semester-specific information here. Uh, but usually in exam two, I give around three equations that I expect you to balance, uh, and I always do that. That is uh, a guaranteed question on the exam. You will have to balance uh, some equations on the exam. So here in the middle of chapter four, we get into some different types of uh, chemical reactions. The first one is precipitation reactions, uh, and there will be solubility precipitation reactions on the exam. Uh, it varies a little bit from one semester to the next how I ask these questions. Uh, usually I will ask either uh, several questions where I have you determine if a, uh, if a molecule is soluble or not. Um, usually there's a question like that in the exam um, and there is also going to be uh, usually a question where I have you do something similar to let's see here, something like this where I have you write out an equation um, and figure out okay if these two molecules combine together in this case it's uh, sodium nitrate and uh, lithium sulfate but uh, you know, obviously it could be something different in your exam. If these two things mix together will something form that will precipitate out? If so, what is that? You know, you just write out the equation. So there will be something precipitation related on the exam. I'm not going to tell you exactly how that question is going to be worded but there will be something along that line on the exam. And I will give you, by the way, uh, this, or, or something very, very close to this. I don't know if it'll be this exact table, but you will have a solubility table on the exam. So you do not have to have the, uh, the solubility table memorized, you just have to know how to use it. All right. So moving on then to acids and bases. Um, I do expect you to understand just the basic outline of an acid-base reaction. So that basic outline is that you have an acid and a base that react together to make some kind of salt molecule. In this case it was actual, literal, just what we call salt. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, and then water. So that is the, the basic uh, outline of an acid-base neutralization reaction is what we would call that, the acid-base neutralization. So I do expect you to know that basic outline and to know that the uh, net ionic equation for this is just making water, is all that ends up being. Oop, ran out of space there. It's going to be H2O at the end. So I do expect you to know that net ionic equation, or at least the result of that net ionic equation, that you just make water. That's the, uh, the end result there of an acid-base neutralization. The acid and base essentially uh, eliminate each other's reactivity and uh, just turn into water. And that's really all I expect you to know from acid-base stuff. It's pretty straightforward there. Uh, redox is, I believe, the last reaction type in this chapter that we look at. 
so that's the oxidation and reduction. There will be, uh, I guarantee you, redox on the exam. Uh, there will be some uh, some number of molecules. Oh, I would say usually I probably do like five or six molecules, something like that, uh, on the exam, and you will have to figure out the oxidation numbers of the atoms in those molecules and or I will have you look at a reaction like this one and figure out the oxidation numbers as well as figuring out which thing is oxidized and which thing is reduced. So I could have both where all you do is just determine the oxidation numbers uh, but more likely um, I will have you do something similar to this um, or similar to one of these where I give you a reaction and you have to figure out the oxidation number of everything in the reaction and uh, determine what's being oxidized and what's being reduced. Uh, but there will for sure be redox reaction stuff on the exam uh, and I will give you this, uh, these rules. Because I am, I am nice. I will give you the rules. Um, so you will have these rules. It won't be over three pages like this. I have a, a version of this that's condensed down to, to just a single page. Uh, but I will give you the rules and you will have to uh, figure out the redox numbers and uh, most likely as well uh, figure out what is being oxidized and what is being reduced. Just remember the oxidation is whatever atom increases in its oxidation number and the reduction is the thing that reduces its oxidation number. So again, it is not an entire molecule that is oxidized or reduced. It is specific atoms inside. So you wouldn't be able to say that the carbon disulfide is oxidized something in there is oxidized but the other thing is reduced so it's not the entire molecule that is oxidized or reduced it is specific atoms all right so i believe this is the last big topic of uh, chapter four here and that is stoichiometry and i'm going to go through this pretty quickly again because i'm trying to keep this relatively short uh, but the culmination of all of this stoichiometry stuff through here uh, is really, well, actually let me, before I get to the, the culmination of it, uh, this slide here, just a, a quick, uh, hint isn't the right word, but um, suggestion I guess, is to make sure that you're very comfortable doing these conversions. These are going from the mass of one thing to mass of something else. Uh, that is going to be a big topic on this exam. Stoichiometry is a big topic. It's an important topic because it comes back a lot uh, in later chapters in this class, but also uh, in other chemistry classes. Essentially every chemistry class after this one, stoichiometry is a big part of it uh, because stoichiometry is how we analyze chemical reactions. Uh, so it's very important that you're comfortable going from the mass of one thing to either the moles of something else or the mass of something else in that same chemical reaction. And so this uh, this little flow chart, if you will, here uh, is a good uh, good thing to study with. Uh, so, like I was saying just a second ago, the, uh, the kind of culmination of this stoichiometry stuff is uh, these kinds of questions back here, where you are given a reaction, given starting materials, and uh, ask to find the theoretical yield, uh, or ask to find the theoretical yield, the percent yield, uh, and or the, the limiting reactant. And so what I'm going to tell you now, and I tell this to every class that I ever have for Gen Chem 1, um, there will be a question on the exam that is very similar to this. This uh, problem right here. 
I will give you some kind of reaction. It will not be super complicated. Um, we're not going to have, like, you know, 12 as a coefficient and 8 as a coefficient. Like, there's, there's not going to be anything like that. It's not going to be super complicated in terms of the, uh, the coefficients. Um, it'll be relatively simple, kind of like this one, where it's just either 1 or 2 are your coefficients. Uh, so you'll have some kind of relatively simple equation. I will tell you the starting materials. Uh, I won't even go as far as this question does and make you do kilograms. I'll just give you a number of grams of material for your two starting materials. <coughs> I will tell you how much of a product is made. Again, it'll just be in grams instead of kilograms, just to keep it as, as simple as possible. And I will ask you to find the limiting reactant, theoretical yield, and the percent yield. So just again to be clear, there will be a question on the exam that will be very similar to this question. And I'm telling you this beforehand just so that you know to, to study this question and make sure you understand how you do these kinds of, of problems. Because it's going to be worth a big chunk of points as well. It'll probably be worth um, at least uh, 12 points or so. Uh, again, again, I'm trying to be general here so this uh, video can be used for multiple semesters, but uh, it'll be worth a, a large number of points uh, because it is a difficult question. And I realize it's a difficult question. That's why I'm giving you this information beforehand so that you know to go in understanding how to do these kinds of problems. So again, there will be a question very similar to this one. I'll give you the starting materials in grams and the amount of one of the products that is produced. And you will need to find the limiting reactant, the theoretical yield, and the percent yield in that problem. All right. So, uh, all that to say, I guarantee there is stoichiometry on the exam. <laughs> Understand how to do stoichiometry problems. And it's possible I could put a simpler stoichiometry problem in, in addition to that one. So again, that is that one is guaranteed to be there. Um, and again, it's not this equation specifically. It'll be different than this equation, but it'll be a simple equation like that one. Uh, but I could put in an additional stoichiometry problem that is uh, uh, not nearly as complex. Like I could just put in something where I have you go from the uh, moles of one thing to moles of something else. That is a much simpler process. Maybe I give you an equation like this one. This one here. I could say you know, if you have 1.2 moles of sulfur dioxide, how many moles of oxygen would you need to react with it? Uh, that would be a relatively simple question, because all I'm asking is just going from moles to moles. And so all you would need is just the ratio. If you remember, it's the ratio that you use to go between these two. So if I gave you, I think I said 1.2 moles of this, um, you would just need half of that for the oxygen, so you would just need 0.6 moles of the oxygen. So I could give you some question like that. It's still stoichiometry, but it's a simpler question, not nearly as many steps. Or maybe I could give you a, uh, a percent yield question where I just give you all the numbers. So like, there's not really any uh, going from mass of one thing to mass of something else, I could just say, you know, if if you uh, if your theoretical yield was 0.91 grams of something, and the actual yield that you produced was 0.71 grams, you know, what's the percent yield? I could give you something like that as well. All right, so then the solution stoichiometry here, this is just going from uh, an amount of something 
usually in liters, but sometimes in mils. So it could be mils or liters to mils or liters of something else. I could put something fairly simple like this on the exam, but I'm not going to guarantee that. Uh, but you should be able to go from the volume of something to the volume of something else. Just remember, you use the molarity for these steps, and you still just use the ratio here. That part doesn't change. Uh, it's just you use the molarity for these uh, other steps to go from number of moles to volume. Okay, and this is just kind of a handy tool for your studying. Uh, titrations, I am not going to test you over. So don't worry about that. Um, you will have a, an acid-base titration lab in this class, uh, and you will talk a bunch about titrations in Gen Chem 2. Uh, if you go on to Gen Chem 2, but I'm not going to test you over those uh, in exam 2 here. All right, so that's chapter 4. Let's look at chapter 5. Chapter 5 is thermochemistry. So here at the beginning, we're just kind of introducing the idea of energy, different types of energy, different ways that energy can be stored and used. Uh, I'm not going to test you over um, these different types of energies. I'm not going to give you uh, a kind of energy or a, a situation where energy is used and say, which one of these is it? Uh, I'm not going to do that. So here we're just, we're still kind of just introducing ideas, introducing concepts. Um, conservation of energy here, again, introducing a new concept. I do expect you to understand the conservation of energy. Uh, and, uh, you know, from one semester to another, I might put in a question maybe where there's a, a relatively simple short answer question about the conservation of energy. Um, it's definitely not a guaranteed question, but uh, you should understand the basic concept of the conservation of energy, that being that uh, you can't create or destroy energy. It just gets moved either from one place to another or from one kind of energy to another. Here again, we're still just kind of setting up the idea uh, the concepts of the chapter, uh, in this case, system and surroundings, which you should, again, be able to understand, but I'm not going to, like, give you a question of just, you know, describe system and surroundings. Like, that's not a very good question. Uh, but you do understand, you do need to understand the difference. So the system is the thing we're interested in. The surroundings is everything else. And then units of energy here. I do expect you to be able to convert from one unit of energy to another. And sometimes I will actually put in a question where just that's the whole question. Just a, a good old unit conversion question, like from exam one. Or maybe I have you convert from uh, calories to joules, or from uh, joules to uh, food calories or kilocalories. I might put in a question like that but it's uh, not guaranteed. All right. So now we're getting into uh, the good stuff here, talking about state functions. I do expect you to know what a state function is. And uh, I do put in questions about state functions fairly regularly on exam two. Not quite so regularly that I guarantee there will be a question, but it is decently common for me to put in a question where I ask you to, uh, in two or three sentences, describe the difference between a state function and a uh, normal, so to speak, function. So the way I would do that is uh, a state function is unique because it is only dependent on starting point and ending point, not the pathway taken in between. That's how I would describe it. Uh, but uh, you should describe it however it makes sense to you, as long as it's correct. Uh, but you should understand state functions, because there there's a decent chance there will be a question about state functions on the exam. Uh, you should also be able to use this equation here to describe the uh, change 
in uh, the internal energy. So the delta E is equal to Q plus W. It's a very simple equation, uh, but uh, the kind of tricky part is working out the signs for Q and W. So make sure that you are comfortable and you understand how to determine is Q positive, is Q negative, is W positive, is W negative, uh, and that all has to do with where the energy is going. Is the heat going in or out? Is the work being done by the system, so the work is essentially going out into something else, or is it being done on the system, so it's coming in. So make sure you're comfortable uh, figuring that out. It's uh, fairly common for me to put in a relatively simple question where it's just uh, kind of a word problem similar to uh, something like this maybe, but obviously not, not quite as wordy as this. <laughs> this question's kind of wordy. Uh, but I might put in a question similar to this one where I say you have this system and there's this work that's being done and this amount of heat that is moving. Uh, what is delta E? Uh, that is a fairly common question that I ask on the exam. All right, so then through here we are introducing the concepts that lead us to this equation. So this, the specific heat equation, or the QMCAT equation as some people call it, um, this will be on the exam. I guarantee it, you, I will expect you to use this equation in at least one problem on the exam. So basically you need to be comfortable um, using the equation to find any part of the equation. So I could give you a question similar to uh, something like this. So here you're trying to find uh, Q, how much heat is absorbed. Uh, but I could also give you a question uh, more similar to uh, something like this, where instead you're finding a temperature now I will tell you I am not going to ask you a question um, that is similar to this one in terms of the algebra and the difficulty there. Uh, this I think it was this question. Yeah. So this question particularly had just a ton of algebra. Um, I am not going to ask you a question like that. If I remember correctly, we had like we had this equation set up. And we had to um, like solve a whole equation on both sides, and there was quite a bit of algebra because we were looking for something inside of the delta t. Um, like there was there was a lot of algebra. I'm not going to ask you a question like that. Um, you will still have to do algebra, but it's not going to be quite as much algebra. Uh, the main reason being that I just don't want you spending. 10 minutes of the exam on algebra when this is a chemistry uh, exam. Especially, well, 10 minutes of algebra on one problem uh, when it's a chemistry exam. I don't mind you spending 10 minutes of algebra in the entire exam, but for, for just one question, that's too much. So I could ask you a question where you would need to have some setup similar to this, but you would probably not have to solve all of both sides. So perhaps I would give you like Q for the water, so you wouldn't have to deal with any of this. You just already have that. And so you would just set that up to be equal uh, and solve for something over here. Uh, but I wouldn't be I wouldn't be making you do like two whole equations and then bring them together to solve for, for one part. Um, kind of like we did here in this one. But there will be a question, at least one, on the exam where you will use the uh, this uh, equation here. So be uh, comfortable using that. You do not have to have any specific heat values memorized. If you need a specific heat value to solve, I will give it to you. Or it will be the thing that you're solving for. So I'll just give you everything else. All right. Uh, as far as pressure volume work, I do expect you to be able to use this equation. It's pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, so be able to do that. 
It's not guaranteed, but it's I, I put it in there every once in a while using that equation. Bomb calorimeters, don't worry about those. I'm not going to put anything on there about bomb calorimeters. Uh, as far as enthalpy, I do expect you to understand the difference between an exothermic reaction and an endothermic reaction. Uh, so be able to tell the difference between those two. Um, kind of similar to what we did here, this question, identifying if it's endothermic or exothermic. It's not guaranteed that I'll put in something similar to this, but it's I put it in every once in a while. What I will guarantee is that I will either... Um, oh, and then, sorry, I was skipping ahead. So in this section here, talking about uh, enthalpy and uh, tying that in with the QMCAT here, um, I could put in a question similar to this, um, but it wouldn't be quite as intense as this one. So this was a pretty intense uh, in terms of time uh, and in terms of number of steps. Uh, it was a pretty intense question. What I could do instead of this, uh, instead of having you work out the whole thing of figuring out what Q is, which is what we did in this problem, we, we worked out what Q was uh, based on the amount of material that was reacting and then plug that in to the QMCAT equation. Uh, so instead of doing something like that, I could put in something that, that's much simpler where maybe um, maybe I just give you Q to begin with uh, and I just say, you know, we have this reaction that's occurring uh, and this much energy comes out of the reaction what must the, uh, you know, the, let's see what we're trying to find here. Yeah, so they were trying to find delta H for the reaction. So I could ask you to find, you know, anything, any of this stuff there. Maybe you know, one of the final temperatures or, you know, what mass of material you had. I could have you find something like that, but it, again, would be much simpler than this equation or this uh, question here. Uh, mostly just for sake of time, because again, I don't want you spending 20 minutes on one question in this exam. All right, so what I thought I was getting to there um, was this section. So I do guarantee that there will be either a Hess's Law question or a question that uses standard heats of formation uh, in this exam. Uh, I won't put both in. It'll be one or the other um, because they're they're both finding the same thing. Hess's law allows you to find the enthalpy change for a reaction and the standard heats of formation also just help you find the uh, standard enthalpy of reaction. Excuse me. Um, so I'll put one of them in uh, and not the other. So you should know how to do both. Uh, they're very uh, closely related in terms of the, the chemistry. The process is quite different, but um, in terms of the chemistry, it's, it's very similar. So just be able to do both. If you need, uh, if I decide to give you a standard heat of formation question, I will give you uh, a table like this one that will have all the information that you need. Obviously, you do not have to memorize standard heats of formation. Um, and if I give you a Hess's Law, I will give you all the equations that you need. You're not going to be making up equations. So I would give you something like this, where I would give you these three equations, and you would just have to figure out some way to uh, massage the equations, so to speak, to get the, uh, the goal equation, either by flipping them or by multiplying them by some value. Right. So I believe that is the end of chapter... So then the last chapter for this exam is chapter 9. So chapter 9 is all about gases. So here we're talking about the kinetic molecular theory of gases, which is how we think about gases in this class. Uh, 
So here we say the gas molecules are in constant motion, their speed increases with temperature, and they're neither attracted nor repulsed by each other. I don't necessarily expect you to have these memorized, but there will be something at the end of this chapter that is related to this that I do expect you to know. Um, so it's not so much that I expect you to have them memorized, but more so I expect you to understand how these aren't perfect, which again we'll get to at the end of the chapter here. Uh, as far as pressure, I do expect you to be able to do pressure unit conversions, just like I expected you to be able to do energy unit conversions. Uh, and again, any conversion factors you need will be given to you. You don't have to have any of these memorized. All right, so here we're talking about these simple gas laws. I expect you to be able to do math problems, do uh, word problems with any of these simple gas laws. So that's Boyle's law, Charles's law, and Avogadro's law. Um, all of the equations, by the way, for this chapter, or for this uh, exam, uh, I believe all of them are given to you. I'll double check here in just a second. Um, but I know all of the gas uh, law equations are given to you. And actually, yeah, I think it is all the, uh, all the equations for all the chapters. Uh, I'll have a handout that's given to you uh, that will have all those equations. So you don't have to have these equations memorized, but the algebra can be a little bit tricky on these, depending on what you're looking for, especially if you're trying to find something in the uh, denominator of any of these equations. That can be a little bit trickier to find, so just be careful. Just uh, uh, make sure you're comfortable doing that algebra beforehand so when you go into the exam, uh, it doesn't catch you off guard. But again, I will expect you to do something with those simple gas laws, and there will be at least one question, I guarantee, on the exam where you will use one of those simple gas laws. I usually only do one. I don't usually do more than one, but there will be at least one uh, simple gas law problem on the exam. Uh, so when we combine those together, we get the ideal gas law, and kind of similar to the simple gas laws, um, you will be given this equation. I expect you to know this equation and be able to find any part of it, and I guarantee you it will be on the exam. So there will be a question on the exam where you will have to use this equation. If you get to the end of the exam and you didn't use it somewhere, then you did something wrong. <laughs> um, either that or you were super skilled with gas law problems and you figured out some way to solve it that even I don't know. Um, and I'm betting it's the uh, the former, not the latter. Um, so you will use this equation on the exam somewhere. There will be a question where you will be expected to use the ideal gas law. So be comfortable using that. Uh, and this constant, by the way, uh, that is on the uh, d cheat sheet that I give you. So you don't have to have that memorized, although you might already just from doing the homework. Uh, STP, that is also on that cheat sheet that I give you, so you don't have to have that memorized, although it's pretty easy to remember. It's just 1 and 0, or 273 Kelvin. Uh, the molar volumes, you don't have to have the molar volume stuff through here memorized, although it can be handy, like it actually is useful. If you can remember that um, for any gas at STP, uh, one mole is going to be the same as 22.4 liters, like that can shorten the amount of work that you have to do on problems, but it's not something I expect you to have memorized. It's just kind of a, a, help, a helpful shortcut if you're comfortable using it. Uh, as far as the density of gases, uh, I do expect you to be comfortable using this equation. I'm not going to go so far as to say I guarantee you're going to be using this on the exam, but I would say, I don't know, maybe half the time I end up putting a density of a gas question on exam two. So be comfortable using this equation. Uh, just like before, I will give you this equation uh, on the cheat sheet, so you just, be a, you just have to be able to use it. 
I remember this kind of italicized M here, that is the molar mass. All right. So here in mixtures of gases, uh, I do expect you to be able to use uh, Dalton's law, where if we have a mixture of gases, the total pressure is just all the individual pressures added together. It's pretty straightforward, very logical, should make sense to you. <coughs> so I expect you to be able to do that. I'm not going to have a really complicated question where you're going to be solving uh, individual ideal gas law equations for three different gases. Uh, and that's not because I don't expect you to be able to do that. You should be able to do that. It's just very time consuming and I'd rather not have you spend again 15-20 minutes um, on one problem like that just because it takes so long to write everything out. Um, so I could ask you a question where it's a simpler version where you're just involving the pressures where you're not doing a whole ideal gas law equation for each one. Um, but uh, it's not something that I guarantee. I'm not guaranteeing there will be a mixture of gases laws, uh, of gases on the exam. But it could be. There could be a simple version. Collecting gases over water is not on the exam. Don't worry about that. Uh, stoichiometry with gases. Uh, I will say this is similar to what I said for the solutions stoichiometry. Uh, it's not guaranteed if I do put something in that involves gases and stoichiometry it will be relatively simple. So just remember the the main difference here you're still using the ratio to go from moles of one thing to moles of something else but getting to that number of moles and out of that number of moles you would use the ideal gas law. instead of uh, the molar mass, depending on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to go from a volume to a volume, then you would need to use the ideal gas law. But again, not guaranteed. If I do put something, it'll be relatively simple. Okay. Uh, I do expect you to know that smaller atoms or molecules in the gas phase move faster. So larger ones move slower, and that's pretty much all I expect you to know from this. The smaller something is, the faster it moves in the gas phase. So then here at the end, there's essentially two things I expect you to know from these slides, and it's when our assumptions break down. I expect you to know that the assumption that... Uh, molecules take up no space, which if you remember that was an assumption from the very beginning of the chapter, that breaks down at very high pressures, and I expect you to know that the assumption that the uh, gas molecules don't interact with each other, that breaks down at very low temperatures. So at very high pressures, the assumption that the molecules don't take up any space breaks down, and at very low temperatures, the assumption that the molecules don't interact with each other breaks down. So that's all I expect you to know from, from all these slides here, talking about real gas behavior. So there's a, a bit here at the end where we make corrections for those two in the ideal gas law. <coughs> I'm not going to have you using this equation. It's really not a terrible equation, it's just lots of busy work, that equation, and so uh, we're not doing any work that needs to be that precise. So we're just not going to use it. So that is it. So, uh, that is a review for exam two. Uh, as always, if you have questions, please email me. I will get back to you as soon as possible, or just uh, ask me the next time we're in class. Uh, and uh, good luck.